Welcome to The Elephant, made with the support of the Climate Kick Alumni Association. I'm Kevin Kaners. You know, sometimes within the issue of climate change, there's a debate on which part of society is really ready to take the lead. Is it the public sector and the government that has the most potential? Or is it the private? Well, my guest today, Jose Maria Figueres, has worked on climate change closely inside both the public and private sectors. He's currently the head of the Carbon War Room. It's an organization that supports initiatives which improve, in a profitable way, the climate sustainability of companies. But Figueres was also the president of Costa Rica from 1994 until 1998. Costa Rica is now one of the most sustainable countries in the world, with virtually all of its electricity generated by renewable sources. And the country aims to be the world's first carbon neutral country by the year 2021. And if his name, Figueres, sounds familiar, other than that is for being the former president of Costa Rica, that's probably because of his sister, Cristiana Figueres, or the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, who played one of the most important roles in the COP21 talks in Paris. During the conference in Paris, I had the chance to sit down with former President Figueres to speak about the efforts of the Carbon War Room, whether the public or private sector is more important when it comes to combating climate change, and a bit about Costa Rica's own ambitious targets to get to zero emissions. Here's a conversation. Jose Maria Figueres, welcome to The Elephant. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here in the context of COP21, which is a fascinating undertaking by the global society, especially if you consider that the world is coming together in Paris to discuss issues of such relevance as climate change. I was interested to see your, you know, your sister, of course, helps oversee this whole UN process. So I was curious, how did uh, a brother and sister become so such high level people within the climate fight? So Christiana, which is my uh, younger sister and myself, we have uh, at different points in time of our careers worked together. And most of that work has been climate related. We both come from a country that privileges the environment and has found a way to make a good business opportunity for the country out of proactive environmental stewardship. And I guess it's just that uh, common interest uh, and uh, sharing these endeavors uh, that have kept us on parallel courses uh, throughout our lives, always looking at the environment as something towards which we have a tremendous responsibility from an ethical and moral point of view but something which can also be very much a center point for development, well-being, jobs, and uh, better lifestyles. How early on did that connection come? Like, were you, did you have a strong connection to nature in your family when you, the two of you were growing up? We both come from a family in which my father and mother, or in which our father and mother, were in public service. And so... Your dad was the president? He was at one point in time president. Uh, My mother was also in public service as a congresswoman, as an ambassador, uh, and very active within civil society in Costa Rica. And so, of course, that uh, policy issues were very much the centerfold conversation over breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, Many of those were related to the environment, and to a good stewardship uh, of resource management, which to a country which is small with limited resources like Costa Rica is, of course, a very important element. Now, you run something called the Carbon War Room, which is all about um, trying to find profitable ways for business to to cut their emissions. Um, And you are also the the president of Costa Rica yourself, and you might run again, am I right? Well... There's something to that, but... So, but I find that really interesting because you're kind of perfectly well-placed between this, like, business sector and public sector. And I was curious about your thoughts on the, the different roles that these two sectors have in combating climate change. Would you, do you see one as more important than the other? Do you see, um, I guess, yeah, what, what role can, can both of those play? And what are the limitations of each? I am firmly convinced that um, mitigating climate change 
and advancing towards a low carbon economy to do so is a perfect arena for the business world and the public world as well as civil society to come together and carve out much more of a common future for humanity. In this road of transition towards a low carbon economy, we will find many places where we will have to find our way forward. After all, this is a transition uh, which all of humanity has to go through and which has never been attempted before. So as we move forward, we will also find better ways to continue in doing so. And better approaches and better ways are always a product of collaborative efforts. So whether, as in the past, civil society, business, and governments found themselves discussing on different sides of the table, I would expect that in moving forward, we could all find ourselves on the same side of the table, even if we don't share necessarily the same objectives or the same viewpoints with respect to the circumstances at hand. But uh, moving towards a low carbon economy is also, in geopolitical terms, a great opportunity for what has traditionally been called the North and the South, or the developed and the developing world to come together. The North has a lot more resources, technology, wherewithal. The South needs a lot of that technology and some help with resources to leapfrog in its development. And instead of following the traditional path of development from an agricultural to an industrial to a services economy, be able to leapfrog, in effect, uh, by moving into all of that and while at the same time lowering carbon emissions. So I find this as a great opportunity, as in fact, uh, I also see it as the greatest opportunity humanity has ever had to kind of reinvent itself along better lines, creating jobs, business, new, uh, new business models, investment opportunities, and in general, also possibilities for entrepreneurship and innovation. You know, I, I saw a speech that you gave a few years ago, and you kind of made that same point that you see climate change as a great opportunity to combat both poverty and inequality and um, fighting them on both fronts, the fight against climate change and the fight against poverty, Absolutely. which is interesting because I, uh, that, that's an argument that uh, Naomi Klein has made in a slightly different way, but uh, one uh, nonetheless, that by investing in green jobs and ensuring that low-income communities, the people who've been marginalized traditionally, get access to those resources first, that this could be a way to equal out what has been a very unequal few decades. Could you just comment on that? Yes, of course. The two big challenges we have going forward as humanity is one dealing with poverty and inequity, because today we have the economic wherewithal and the technology to be able to do so. And the other challenge is, of course, the challenge of climate change and lowering carbon emissions. Both can be tackled by the same instruments and by moving to a low carbon economy. There is where I see the opportunity for those that are behind in the development curve to leapfrog up to the front. That's where we can create the jobs, the entrepreneurship opportunities, and everything related to just living better lives on the planet. I was, I was also curious what you would see on her point, the idea that you know, to, to combat climate change, we need a strong public sector because we need to make quite ambitious uh, investments in things like clean energy and in things like public transit, right? And the idea of austerity, which has really sort of pinched governments around the world, kind of is antithesis. It makes it harder to solve the climate crisis by governments not being able to invest in these types of solutions. So we're going to need three things to be able to bring down carbon emissions and solve the climate change challenge. One is very good policy. Second is innovation and technology. And the third one is financing. The three are absolutely fundamental. You need good policy to send markets correct signals with respect to the 
way in which we want to develop ourselves towards the future, those areas we want to privilege with their investment, their entrepreneurship, wherewithal, and their abilities to go in and create business and jobs and opportunities and well-being. Aside from good policy that moves us in the direction of a low-carbon economy, you need innovation and technology. With today's technological breakthroughs, we are able to take out about 40 or 50 percent of carbon emissions in the world. We still need to work on the rest, and that requires for innovation. And then, aside from that, you will need financing, because there is the need to retool the world economy that has been humming for the last 200 years of industrial revolution in a very carbon intensive mode to continuing to provide opportunities for well-being but in a low carbon perspective. And that retooling will require financing of the type that the world has never needed before, which requires for an extraordinary effort to rethink how we're going to use the financial tools in the world of today to effectively finance the transition. And, and do you think a lot of that should come from the public sector? It'll come from all sectors. A lot of it will be capital invested by corporations <clears throat> once they see clear policies uh, that give them a sense of direction on where they should be investing. But it will also come from governments and from international organizations. What are, the, what are the, some of the main government policies that you think would be really helpful to move quickly towards a sustainable future? So I think that uh, the first order of business is energy efficiency. Uh, energy is responsible for about 70 or 75 percent of total carbon emissions. The world wastes between 15 and 25 percent of energy. And so you, you're saying so the government could mandate more efficient uh, laws or for products and whatnot? I think that there's a lot of policy that can go into mandating energy efficiency. Uh, there's a lot of policy that can go into stimulating energy efficiency retrofits through uh, tax benefits and other instruments. Um, but that's low-hanging fruit because we have the technology to do that. We could lower about 20% of the energy requirements in the world today, which would mean an equivalent reduction of about 20% of total carbon emissions, which is huge. And we could create hundreds of thousands of jobs around the world and opportunities for new businesses as we do it. Is it true that Costa Rica has plans to be carbon neutral by something, it was something like 2021? So this year our energy uh, base has been 98% renewable outside of transportation. Uh, as of next year, 100% of our energy outside of transportation will be renewable. Is that the vast majority of that hydroelectric? Uh, that's hydro, geothermal, wind, solar, and now moving faster into distributed generation with solar. Uh, and we have a target to be carbon neutral by the year 2021. It is an ambitious target. Uh, it will require a tremendous amount of effort, especially on the transportation sector. But it is certainly something that we should aim for. Uh, I'm reminded here, in terms of this ambitious target, of President Hollande's opening statement at COP21, when he said, if I may paraphrase him, that uh, our biggest danger was not to set our aims very high and miss them, but to set them very low and then stay there. And I have the definitive impression that climate change requires boldness and requires courage. It requires setting high marks and then striving to achieve them by working together more than anything else. Is there anywhere or any individual that uh, where you really see that, that boldness, any country maybe, besides uh, Costa Rica's example? Costa Rica has some good examples, and yet it has a lot, long way to go in many others. Uh, but there are a few countries in the world today that can boast, if one can use that expression, of being 98% uh, renewable-based, uh, except for transportation. Uh, and I think that we still have a lot to learn from each other uh, in terms of country development, 
and pilot programs that can be scaled up and interesting things that are being uh, done. Um, I see uh, tremendous advancement in distributed solar generation in some countries in Europe and even the US. So distributed, that means like on people's rooftops. rooftops and Exactly. Putting solar on rooftops, which is a much better way to go about it. Because it, it kind because of evens out the cloud cover or things like that? No, it's a much better way to go about it because it takes advantage of in infrastructure we already have, the roofs we already have. Uh, it gives you power right there. Uh, you're the homeowner, it gives you power right there. And by having a good amount of distributed energy in the grid system, you also achieve greater quality of your electricity in the grid, which is a very important consideration. So there are examples of uh, distributed solar energy production in the world today, which are examples to emulate and certainly which the developing world should look at very closely in terms of powering up for the future. One of the, the policies that, of course, gets a lot of attention, and I, I spoke to James Hanson the other day, and it's one he specifically is really pushing, is, is a carbon fee, uh, which could either be revenue neutral or one that would go back a into... A carbon? A carbon tax or carbon fee. What do you think about that particular proposal? I think it's a very good proposal. Uh, Costa Rica has had a carbon tax since 1995. What? How much is it? Seven and a half percent of the price of fuels, fossil fuels. So it's paid at the pump uh, because when you're going to buy fossil fuels, you're going to burn them and issue or emit carbon emissions. It's also a very easy way to collect the carbon tax. It's uh, progressive. Uh, and it, in, in the case of Costa Rica, it provides a financing for an environmental services fund that then allows us to go in and buy environmental services in the country, which is one of the financial vehicles we have used to uh, increase our forest cover in the last 25 years. So that money specifically goes back into environmental programs? Goes back into the planting of trees, goes back into the protection of aquifers, it goes back into the protection of watersheds that produce the water that goes into our hydroelectrical dams for energy generation, um, environmental services in general that should have a value. And is it on like things like coal too or just on, on gasoline on the pump? Uh, we use no coal in Costa Rica, so it's on all other uh, fossil fuels. Well, looking forward, we're in a very kind of difficult moment. The, the current pledges that are, have been submitted by the world only take us to, at best, 2.7 degrees, uh, at worst, quite a bit higher than that. And uh, we need to stay under 2 degrees at the very most, most scientists say. And yet there is some ramping up of ambitions. There are some you know, early good signs that people are, are taking this problem much more seriously than they did you know, in 2007 or 2009. What gives you hope uh, and what are you most worried about as well going forward? Um, well, even the 2.7 degree centigrade figure gives me hope. Uh, coming into Paris, we had nothing of the sort. We were going for a five or six degrees change in the planet on the trajectory we were. So if in COP21 we bring it down to 2.7, I think that's a great starting point for what will undoubtedly become a much stronger revolution going forward to move to a low carbon economy. And then you already see signs that are encouraging with respect to lowering the 2.7 degrees centigrade. China yesterday announced here at COP21 that it is going to be early peaking its carbon emissions, bringing it back from 2040 to 2030. That's huge, that's monumental. And China furthermore announced that they are willing to share uh, the process of how they plan for that with other countries and nations around the world that need that type of help to be able to track their own trajectory uh, as we move forward. So I am optimistic, I am bullish. I believe that uh, having last Monday at Paris uh, COP21 inauguration, the largest ever congregation of heads of state and government that has ever been seen by humankind to all discuss and talk 
about climate change is certainly to be noted. Uh, there's no way we can say that this is not top priority on the political agenda of countries around the world. And just one final point, uh, I talked to the scientist uh, John Schellenhuber, uh, and one point he made was that, you know, if we actually solve the climate crisis, it means more cooperation than there's probably ever been at the international stage. Whereas if we don't actually take ambitious steps and if we let it slide, then it could mean much more chaos and fighting in the world. That is absolutely the case because um, the disruption to global society that climate change would bring uh, is unparalleled with anything that we have seen. I mean, uh, Europe is now in a perplexing, challenging, difficult situation because of the migration coming in from Syria. And that's in the uh, middle to low hundreds of thousands per year. Think of the migration caused by climate change if ocean levels rise. Uh, think of where 40 or 50 million people from Bangladesh have to migrate if that country loses one-third of its territory with only a 50 centimeter raise in ocean levels. That would be a completely different world and one that we should definitely do everything we can not to get even close to. That is why COP21 is a very good starting point. It will be huge and monumental, and I'm sure it will also be able to be improved and perfected with time. Well, Jose Maria Figueres, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. That was my conversation with Jose Maria Figueres. And that's all the time we have for The Elephant this time. The Elephant is made by myself, Kevin Kaners, along with Christina Peters and Matthias Gutz, and with support from the Climate Kick Alumni Association, a group of entrepreneurs and young professionals working to create a climate resilient society. You can find out more at ckaa.eu. I'm Kevin Kaners. See you soon.